Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's presentation on the shape of Canada's infrastructure stimulus presented by Renew Canada in partnership with Global Public Affairs. My name is Andrew Macklin, Managing Editor of Renew Canada Magazine, and I am very excited to be your host and moderator for today's conversation. The shape of Canada's infrastructure stimulus is something that we will be analyzing thanks to three political leaders from three political parties all of which had a significant role to play in infrastructure stimulus when it was first brought in in 2009 following the 2008 recession. We'll welcome the Honorable John Baird, the Honorable Daryl Dexter, and the Honorable Christy Clark to our conversation in just a few minutes. Before we get started with our presentation, I just wanna go through a few ways that you can get involved in today's conversation. First of all, you'll see the chat on the right-hand side of our presentation. Please feel free to introduce yourself and network with colleagues who are also taking part in today's conversation, which has over 400 people registered. So we're very excited to have all of you here with us today. We also wanna remind you that there is, this is an interactive conversation. You can ask a question at any time by clicking on the ask a question box along the bottom of your screen. If there is a question that you see that you also would like to see asked, you can vote on the left-hand side. That will raise it as a priority and we will potentially get to your question even quicker. Also, I invite you to take part in our polls today. You'll see the polls tab along the bottom. We are taking in some key information from today's conversation where you think that you would like to see investment, what you think are the priorities as we look to infrastructure stimulus across Canada. I also want to remind you that uh, you can see along the bottom, you'll see the Renew Canada link will be providing live links throughout the conversation to websites from our speakers and from us as well. So we can continue the infrastructure stimulus conversation long after today's discussion is over. And just a reminder that if you are having audio and video problems based on the connectivity in your neighborhood and in your community, please remember that by registering for today's event, you are given free access to a video presentation of this recording uh, within a couple of days afterwards. So we will have that for you after our presentation is complete. I also just want to take a quick moment to remind you that today's conversation is specifically focused on the shape of Canada's infrastructure stimulus and any questions or comments that are dealing with issues that are not related to infrastructure stimulus will not be addressed during our conversation today. This is strictly what we will be talking about throughout today's conversation. Lastly, I want to remind you that if you are providing some live tweeting of today's conversation, please use the hashtag infrastimulus in your tweets and as well be sure to tag both of your presenting partners for today at renew canada and at gpa insights without further ado we're ready to begin today's conversation and it is my great pleasure to welcome to set the stage for today's conversation the president and chief operating officer of global public affairs, Genevieve Young. And Genevieve will provide us with a few minutes of context to get our conversation started. And there she is. Good morning, Genevieve. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this panel, Andrew. I really look forward to hearing the discussion forthcoming to my remarks. What I got to do is set the stage for this discussion and given our panelists, this is a real treat for me. <laughs> so let's touch on a few of the pre-COVID infrastructure landscape uh, uh, criteria and issues, our current circumstance, and then some, let's think a little bit about uh, how as we transform Come out of post uh, or coming out of COVID and post pandemic, some things to think about as we think about the infrastructure landscape. So Canada's infrastructure deficit is certainly well documented and efforts have been made by successive governments to address these issues through targeted programs focused on trade enabling infrastructure, social and affordable housing, green transit, community infrastructure initiatives. At the federal level, uh, these integrated pieces of the long term or infrastructure plan equate to historic spending commitments. These integrated pieces are designed to leverage additional funding and deliver on national, provincial, and municipal economic and policy objectives. Provincially, while the dollar values are lower in real terms, they are no less significant and priorities range from public transit, electrification, affordable housing, hospitals, highways, and broadband. Certainly at the municipal level, 
large and smaller capital plans are managing forward a number of transit, tra transit and transportation initiatives in addition to others focused on green or climate related projects. So in the aggregate, these are really big numbers and these are very important initiatives and projects. So COVID has been called the great revealer. It's the great revealer of economic community and social fabric gaps in areas of crisis. In some of parts of the crisis now, these are not just uh, small, these are chasms. And in turn, it may also be the great accelerator of change. For infrastructure, the major challenges that were apparent in the sector are even near, are clearer now, and it certainly complicates the conversation when we're viewing infrastructure only through an economic stimulus lens. Some of these issues include existing debt levels for the provinces before the pandemic and are now certainly more challenging. While there's some room, or more debt room in the West, in the East, the situation is very dire with a couple of provinces. I'm here in, in Ontario and the deficit will nearly quadruple to $41 billion and the debt to GDP ratio will jump to 49.7% due to the COVID-19 costs, according to a just released report from the Financial Accountability Office. Another issue is that capital spending plan, plans and priorities may no longer be priority projects because of the economic impact and fallout of COVID and where community need is most great. Certainly Minister McKenna did acknowledge some of this earlier in the week with one of her announcements. And of course, at the local level, municipal planning and priority setting may be different from provincial and federal with operating shortfalls now, 10, now nearing 10% in the case of Calgary or 15% for Toronto. Similar impacts are across the country in all jurisdictions. And of course, all of these issues are exasperated by the necessary shutdown of the construction industry with Quebec taking the largest hit in April at a 39% drop in employment in the sector alone. So even with some of these construction projects and work carrying on, employment for the sector took a hit of 21% in April. These are very sobering numbers and the impacts to not only jobs, but the supply chain and the viability of some of these projects planned or contemplated is clearly now in question. As we know, infrastructure is always in the playbook for economic uh, stimulus and recovery. I'm absolutely looking forward to the outcome of Andrew's poll and what should be in the definition of shovel ready, as it has and does take on all kinds of different meanings in this time of economic stimulus or required economic stimulus. Uh, because of some of these challenges, and especially those related to debt and operating losses, infrastructure as stimulus may need to take some different forms, and it may provide opportunities to transform the sector as a post-COVID world takes shape. Economic advisory groups have already been set up to start to tackle some of these issues and debate them. So governments have very tough decisions to make around some critical areas for immediate impact to the sector. Immediately focusing on resolving COVID related delays and costs to the sector to amongst other things, retaining and supporting skilled workers and maintaining cash flow through the system. Accelerating project pipelines to enable them to be shovel ready and potentially designing this common understanding of, of shovel ready. Uh, streamlining approval processes and collaborating with all three levels of government, government on project criteria and eligibility upfront. Over the medium to longer term, there are likely ways to also enhance collaboration and innovation for the sector to ensure that the existing dollars allocated are maximized for medium and longer term impact. Some of these measures could be, these are just some ideas, building a national tri-level multi-year project pipeline that contemplates a post-COVID reality. Focus on repair and maintenance and the existing project pipeline. There are already a large number of projects in the process with uh, each major city in Canada, except Winnipeg has a real project at a fairly advanced stage. That's just another thought. Increased funding for pre-development to improve the impact of the investments, much like the work that the Canadian Infrastructure Bank has done to assist in de-risking some of the larger and more complicated projects on the front end. And this is a very important piece allowing technology and digitization a role in the procurement process and permitting with a view towards streamlining uh, project approvals and reducing uh, timelines. Technology is absolutely key as we get to the other side of this pandemic. So to finish, while infrastructure is always looked at as the way to create economic stimulus, there's probably an opportunity to leverage infrastructure into real economic transformation as the acceleration of the COVID related impacts continue. Thank you so much, Andrew. I really look forward to participating in this conversation. We really appreciate you providing that scene center for us to appreciate really what the key subjects are that we need to talk about today. Thank you so much. Without further ado, it's time for us to introduce the three political leaders. And it's it's pretty awesome when you get to 
introduce three people who all play prominent roles in infrastructure stimulus and from three different political parties. We're really overjoyed to have these three with us today. And we'll start by introducing the Honorable Mr. John Baird. And John had a political career spanning almost two decades, both in the Ontario government as well as the federal government and was a key cabinet minister under Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Mr. Baird served as the Minister of Transport, but also held portfolios such as Minister of Environment and Minister of Foreign Affairs. So we welcome John to our conversation this morning as one of our key presenters. The second speaker that we'll be welcoming to our conversation is the Honorable Daryl Dexter. Daryl was the leader of the New Democratic Party at the provincial level in Nova Scotia for 12 years and was Premier of Nova Scotia from 2009 to 2013. There's Daryl, good morning and Hi. welcome Daryl. Hi Andrew. And for, for our third guest, the Honorable Christy Clark. Christy was the Deputy Premier in British Columbia in the early 2000s and became Premier of British Columbia in 2011. Uh, Christy, is, Christy along with John are both Senior Advisors at Bennett Jones. Well, Daryl is a vice president at Global Public Affairs. Good morning, Daryl. Good morning, Christy. And I know John will be joining us shortly for our conversation. Um, you know, while we wait for, for John to get into the conversation, Daryl, why don't we look to you first and talk about at the time that infrastructure stimulus came forward, uh, I'm sure it was a very delicate balance between what the federal government saw as priorities and what the province saw as priorities. And I'm just wondering um, what you had to do in order to be able to balance those priorities for infrastructure stimulus. Well, there are actually a series of conversations that take place whenever an infrastructure program comes forward. I mean, first and foremost is just looking at program design. Uh, but uh, the, the, the province would have a list of its own infrastructure projects, but it would go out and consult with municipalities, try and figure out what they had in the pipeline that was actually ready to go in the way of uh, in the way of projects. And then they would assemble a list of uh, of um projects which they felt would be uh, provincial priorities they would take those uh to the federal minister responsible and uh, i would i would say there would be a sometimes a, a rigorous uh debate about which projects should go in which order and the way in which they should be timetabled uh but i don't in, in any way uh you know dismiss the legitimacy of that debate it's a, it's a it's one that should be appropriately had the federal government will have uh somewhat different priorities than, than the provinces. And I think this points to a way forward, actually. And, and I would like to see uh, that provinces get included in the early questions around program design uh, as, the, as we look to the uh, new infrastructure stimulus program. Thank you very much, Daryl. Christy, you're in a very unique situation where you were removed from politics in 2009 when the recession fund, the infrastructure stimulus funding began being put into the provinces. Then in 2011, you come into office. And I'm just kind of curious to know when you got into office in 2011, kind of what was the status of that infrastructure funding uh, and, and how were you able to use that as far as provincial priorities to keep that funding getting into the communities and moving forward? Well, and it was important because when I came in in 2011, we were, um, you know, we were, we were still stuck after the 208 meltdown. We were in, we ran, we were running deficits. So my, my first priority was to get us back into uh, surplus, which we did. In I think we were, I think we did five balanced budgets um, after I think two deficit budgets. One, one which was the previous government's. So, um, what we our approach to that was to say we're going to cut back government spending as much as we can. We're going to hold the line on wages on government employees. We are going to try and shrink the size of government, but we're going to spend money on infrastructure. So what we did is we went to the federal government and you know, it was the Harper conservatives at the time. They were very much of the same view as we were, which was if you invest in infrastructure money that is going to go to projects that are going to create more economic opportunities. So that's roads, rail, ports, bridges, um, that, you, you know, basically the, the gateway, um, 
then you're going to see a huge economic uh, opportunity created in mines in LNG. Like we weren't that at the time, we weren't that interested in building hospitals and water parks and all those other things, which are important, but they don't have a lot of economic spinoff. And so we, we really found a lot of common ground very early with the federal government around that stuff. And um, their members of parliament were hugely helpful in that. And to be honest, you know, municipal, uh, uh, municipal uh, government's interests in this came later when we had a lot more spending room because mm-hmm. those were the those were the more local community issues like hospitals like you know stoplights like um, sewers and those kinds of things which matter to communities but they don't create a whole lot of jobs in the long term and I think I think that's what's going to be important in this debate is is Canada going to focus on building infrastructure where you build it, the jobs are done and the workers move on, or are we going to focus on building infrastructure that expands Canada's economic capacity in the long term? And I think that's really, I mean, we've seen huge gaps in that uh, as, over the last little while. All of our, all of those gaps have been exposed and I think we really, that's where we need to focus. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we expect John to, to join us uh, momentarily. We just had a, a quick issue, but we are bringing him into the conversation. Um, I'm just kind of curious as far as, I mean, both of you were in situations where you are dealing with a party that is not your own. And I'm just wondering, did that relationship, that federal provincial, you know, we're, we're playing on different sides kind of relationship. Did that play into it at all? Or was it very simply a, no, we need to get the funding out. We all recognize that there are infrastructure priorities. Let's get moving on this. Sorry, go ahead, Daryl. Aside, from what I put that all aside, it was not, you know, um, these were projects that needed to happen. We, we had, uh, um, you know, goals that we wanted to meet, and 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 by and large, especially the staff level, where a lot of that negotiation takes place, it was about how do we move this forward in the most expeditious way um, that it is possible. Uh, it wasn't really about um, um, you know the you know the political ramifications of any particular aspect of a program. It was um, it was uh, in many ways much more clinical as far as I was concerned. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Christy. Well, I, I'm not really, I'm not, um, the Conservatives always thought I was a Liberal and the Liberals always thought I was a Conservative. So <laughs> what I learned though, from dealing with other Premiers, because we're a coalition party in British Columbia, um, the, it, all Prime Ministers can't stand dealing with Premiers, no matter what party they're from. And in fact, sometimes you see the greatest conflict between premiers and prime ministers from the same party. So I'm not sure that that really, um, you know, prime ministers always feel like premiers are, are feel like they're too much uh, amongst equals. And, um, and premiers always feel like prime ministers don't give them enough respect. So I'm not sure that's really, I, I you know, I think that the thing is, is what is the political meeting point for where's the political benefit between the two groups, right? So you can, if you're opening um, uh, a rapid transit station, the federal member of parliament and the provincial uh, MLA or MNA or MPP will be there participating, saying thank you and all getting a little bit of political benefit out of it. I'm not sure that, you know, you can kind of, if, if I, let me put it this way, if I was gonna be proposing infrastructure to government and thinking about, okay, I wanna make a pitch for my project, what I would say is, okay, what do members of parliament want that have a big voice in this federal government? What does the provincial government want to promote? And where are their influential members? And how do you put the two of them together to try and make the pitch work? Right, no, that, that makes sense. Go ahead, Daryl. I think ironically, the, the, the largest infrastructure project that took place between 2009 and 2013 in Nova Scotia didn't come through the stimulus project uh, program. It actually came through the National Shipbuilding Procurement Strategy, which was something in the order of $25 billion and, of course, rolls out over many, many years. And we likened it to, 
having the Vancouver Olympics every year for 25 years. So, you know, a, a kind of major project that was going to, uh, you know, boost the economic fortunes of the of the of the province and, and indeed it's it's done that and continues to do that and you know what, what's interesting about that is it's not a public sector infrastructure project like the piece that we got of that which was a huge one for um for the shipbuilding uh, stuff on the north shore here it's you know that was an example of the federal government's procurement money going out into the private sector and being used much more efficiently than it would be if the money was spent by the public sector on a public sector project. And, um, you know, for Nova Scotia and for BC as well, we were in there trying to figure out how we were gonna support um, tax incentives, how we were gonna support training incentives to make sure that it was, it was as cheap as possible a project for the federal government in making their procurement decision. And I think one of the questions for, um, you know, that we should be, that the federal government should be thinking about is how much of their, how much of their capital money spending do they want to put into purely public sector projects and how much of it do they want to use investing in the private sector and letting the private sector not just, you know, get a contract with the federal government, but actually letting the private sector do the job. And I think, um, you know, we should be thinking about that, particularly with the oil sands and some of the other uh, struggling, but very, very important areas of Canada's economy. And, and it's never really sexy to talk about process, but the process in the, in the national shipbuilding procurement strategy was a good one. Um, it was a high quality process. It was very transparent. And, um, you know, the federal government, the Harper government, uh, really deserve credit for the way in which they um, uh, allowed that process to take place without political interference, making balanced decisions. Yeah, and it was hard. Remember, Davy Shipyards was in there. Yeah, there, was, there was a lot of politics. And th that was, I think, one thing that really distinguished the federal conservative government is, uh, I mean, I've only, I've, I was premier under two different governments. Um, so not, I can't speak to everyone in Canadian history, but I will say they were very uh, careful about trying to decontaminate politics from these infrastructure spending issues. I don't think that, you know, that is the same today, um, unfortunately, but maybe after, you know, maybe the need and the, the urgency of the COVID recovery is going to mean that there's less politics in it, at least I'd hope so. And you guys bring up a really interesting point because I know, you know, as we look back 10 years, it's really easy to say, well, you know, this was wrong and this was wrong. And we don't like this and we would have done this differently. And it's really great to hear so much positivity to show that, you know, how much great was done, how much was done. Because, I mean, this wasn't, expected this wasn't something that uh you know the conservative government had had years to plan ahead for this was something that you know in just a few short months they had to get a really strong plan in place similar to the situation that's happening with the current liberal government you know trying to figure out very quickly and very strongly what that plan is to be able to put in place and to be able to get money out the door as fast as possible yeah absolutely and that, that, like I said, that does paint a bit of a picture for the way forward. Every one of these programs really has three design, participation, and execution. And unfortunately, and I, I'm not trying to pick on the current government, but their execution on projects so far uh, has not been all that I think people would like it to be. So uh, I think on the early side, it's getting the, the provinces and consulting with them uh, early on to get a good design. Uh, and then it's understanding how the provinces are gonna participate. And Jen uh, touched on the whole question of debt levels and what those are gonna look like and go forward process. And I think there's gonna have to be, and this may be a little bit controversial, but I think we're gonna have to put the debt panic conversation aside for four or five years and we're going to have to just look at um, you know what it's going to take to get the provinces and the federal government uh, back uh, uh, GDP levels back to where they should be uh, and that means uh, being ready to make uh, investments even when you know you know it's going to affect your debt profiles really Canada has an enviable debt profile right now 32 percent of GDP if, if the federal government's uh, uh, debt level gets to a trillion dollars, which is expected, that's going to just about double 
the debt to GDP uh, ratio. But I think we, we have to accept that even at that, uh, it's about half of what the U.S. is is and on par or about what Germany's is. So we're not in a bad position. We can participate. And the other point I would make is that in a lot of cases, the provinces, and Christy, may, she would know the debt profile of BC much better than I would, but um, you know, we're, we're paying off 30-year um, uh, debt. Uh, so it was accumulated at a time when the interest rates were very high. So you're paying off expensive debt and you're acquiring debt at very low rates. So um, your debt servicing costs mean that you can support uh, uh, more debt. It's never ideal, but, but it is, from a practical perspective, a better position to be in. Yeah, well, you know, uh, we, we, I, we, I, we could get into a discussion about debt. Daryl and I think probably have a very different, I'm always in a debt panic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, do, I think he's right. I, I think the reality is, though, that this current government does not care about debt as much as I might. Um, and they've certainly demonstrated that over the last, you know, with running consistent and growing deficits over the last, uh, the last, uh, the mandate and this one as well. So the reality is, okay, we're not having that conversation in Canada. They're going to keep spending. And I think the question is, well, then what are you going to spend the money on? And the problem is, and, and Daryl, you talked about this a little bit, is the, the Harper government had a really strong discipline around, um, depoliticizing de to the extent possible infrastructure spending. And then in addition to that, they really understood the connection between government um, policy and growth. So they, they had a good sense of what impairs growth and what uh, creates growth. That meant they went on a, a, you know, they worked hard to cut regulation. They worked hard to support a tax regime that was going to be providing incentives in the right areas rather than the wrong areas. Um, and that I'm not sure that that intellectual connection is very strong in the current government. And I don't think that there's a, a culture in the civil service that developed over the last few years around with that kind of focus. And that's my worry about it. Um, my, you know, I think it's, it, it didn't seem quite so dangerous to have uh, the shepherd of Bill C-69 in the infrastructure portfolio as it does today, because the problem we're going to have with getting, uh, you know, shovel ready has a whole new standard now because of Bill C-69 and other bills that the federal government has brought in around um, on, the reg on the regulatory side. And so think about the new, the new standard that they are creating today, as a matter of fact, in the deal that they're doing with the Wet'suwet'en, uh, hereditary chiefs around Indigenous consultation in the country. That's all changing in real time as we speak. Think about the new regulatory burden that's put on by Bill C-69. That's all going to be new and untested um, in the coming. So when you think about what's shovel ready, if it hasn't already been approved, I think we are going to have a huge problem getting anything out the door. So, you know, the railways have got some some projects approved and underway. I think that's got to be the first priority because I don't see how Minister McKenna, given her ideological um, bent on these things, is going to be able to get anything shovel ready through. And sorry, that no, that's but that brings up a really good point because I know part of the discussion that we've been having on our end of things the last two months is that definition of shovel ready. Um, you know, and, and I know that a lot of the conversation adjusts between shovel ready and shovel worthy, but then you look at kind of the other class of assets. And I know what we've talked a lot about is asset maintenance and repair. You know, we suddenly 10 years later have municipalities, a lot of whom have fairly robust asset management programs that have a laundry list of infrastructure repair projects, maintenance projects, upkeep projects that desperately need to get done, but are, are basically ready to go. And I'm just kind of wondering, you know, as we look to what shovel ready means in a 2020 context, do we start looking at things like asset maintenance and repair to help municipalities kind of shrink that infrastructure deficit at the local level? Well, I think, I think provinces would I certainly, I'll speak only for myself. We certainly would have liked to have had the ability to use, you know, maintenance and repair contracts as part of the infrastructure program. Uh, it's never, again, it's part of that, that, 
problem is everybody likes to put a seal on something that's nice and new and shiny and you see it all the time. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of infrastructure projects out there um, from, you know, past investments that, that are still um, serviceable, still uh, a part of the fabric of those communities. And, uh, you know, in my mind, they should be, you know, uh, included in the program and, and uh, they're, uh, they're, and they're likely much closer to that, what I would consider the, the definition of shovel ready than a lot of the other uh, uh, projects that are just kind of on the drawing board. And I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Cause I think they're, I mean, the tragedy of it is though, that the federal government's infrastructure money should be primarily going to projects that are going to create long-term economic growth and open up the, the gateway to the East, to the West infrastructure corridors, um, you know, everything from railway sidings to pipeline corridors, to the electrification of the oil sands, all of those massive infrastructure projects that are going to have huge long-term uh, impact that are going to have spillover effects uh, for the economy. I think their current um, regulatory environment, which has become so burdensome and the, and the, their mistaken efforts to, that are changing the landscape for indigenous consultation are going to make those next to impossible. So Daryl is right. They should be spending it on that. But I would add more because they don't have any other choice. They won't. They haven't allowed themselves any other choices because shovel ready has now become such a limited category. So let's yeah, I also yeah. make another good point that's been made uh, by Christy in, in in Atlantic Canada. If you're going to do projects that are going to be of great value uh, uh, from an economic perspective, I think those have to be regional. And I think you, I think that means a level of cooperation among Atlantic Canadian uh, uh, provinces on some of these larger, uh, larger projects. And and it was something that I tried to work away every day. In fact, I, in my office, we would, uh, you know, find strategies to kind of build confidence among the premiers in Atlantic Canada, because we knew that even if the smaller projects were were you know not as uh, kind of sexy from a from a uh, uh, an infrastructure perspective. It was those that would lead to larger projects because we had to have confidence in each other, uh, and uh, that's. Uh, you know, it's just a simple fact. The, each one of the jurisdictions in, in around Atlantic Canada are small, and our economic power is so much greater when we work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what some of those specific kinds of projects are, because, you know, I, I took a quick view of the questions a few minutes ago, and there's a lot of people kind of focusing in on, okay, so what are we talking about? What kind of projects need to be the focus and Christy you made a really interesting point talking about some of these corridors like you look to somewhere like Quebec and a lot of their transportation budget focus for example is those connecting corridors the route 185 phase three the route 389 where it's those let's improve the highway networks that get us to the next province over to ensure that we've got better trade routes so obviously some of those projects need to become priorities, but what else should be priorities for this country? And take it take it from whatever viewpoint you want, whether it's a, you know, to keep the economy going, uh, environmental benefit, health benefit, but what should we really be looking at for that infrastructure stimulus this time around? Well, I would say, I mean, the interprovincial roads are important because primarily because they create an opportunity for export. And what we, I mean, I, I, the, what I always think about when I think about economic growth is, all right, where do you get the most bang for the buck? It's when we can convert Canadian products, manufactured and onion manufactured, into foreign dollars that, are, that we're bringing back into the country. So we're creating new wealth and bringing it back into Canada. So, um, and in addition to that, large projects that attract big foreign investment, which is an area where we have just crashed uh, in the last few years. Um, so to me, that's pipelines, 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 pipelines. We need them. We need railway. We need our railway infrastructure continue to be upgraded and expanded for sure. Our ports need to continue to grow. I mean, Vancouver Port um, has, you know, is the fastest growing port at, and um, Prince Rupert is doing gangbusters up in the North Coast. It's that trade with the A Asian gateway, which is hugely important for us. Um, and uh, and roads, you know, you know, you think about you think about how products get to Vancouver Port. 
they come right across the country and there are bottlenecks right, you know, from Nova Scotia all the way to Vancouver. So, you know, that's everything from overpasses to tunnels to, you know, as I said, railway sightings. That's, I think, where we need to focus the money um, and get that export oriented infrastructure going as a priority. Um, and then think about other, you know, think about um, internal trade as a secondary thing. And I guess the last thing that I didn't mention would be um, uh, the kind of the, 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 the grease that makes the wheel work, which is electrification across the country. So that east west electrification corridor, in particular, I would say from Churchill to the oil sands and from Site C in British Columbia to the oil sands to help us also meet our climate goals. Yeah, I, I, from Atlantic Canada's perspective, we like, like to have an Atlantic gateway just in the same way that there is a gateway uh, on the West Coast. And, and that means uh, the development of, uh, you know, intermodal transportation. That means a good rail network, good rail connections. It means um, um, in, improving the highway infrastructure. All of these are uh, important. And I think it's something that you could get a fair amount of agree agreement on among at least the Atlantic um, uh, uh, provinces. Now, uh, there is a, a big political question that is wrapped up in that because there is a fair amount of competition between the Port of Halifax and, and Montreal. And, you know, that has been a political sticking point for many years. Uh, we invest heavily in, uh, you know, kind of operationalizing the Port of Montreal with um, uh, the work that is done every winter in the um, uh, you know, through the Coast Guard. Um, but when we try to attract money into rail development into the East Coast, that, that for some reason seems to be a problem. And uh, so I understand that there's a lot of politics at play um, in, in those decisions. Uh, but if you want economic prosperity in the East, then proper infrastructure, um, uh, transportation infrastructure is going to be important. And we should be the gateway to Canada, and we should be the Canada's gateway to Europe. And uh, I've, I, you know, I said that throughout my time as Premier, and I still believe it's true. Now, in both the cases of, of your respective provinces, um, you know, I, I hear exactly what you're saying, especially with ports, you know, because when you look at the transportation end of things, I mean, Daryl, in your province, they're pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into upgrading the 100 series highways. Christy, in your province, you see the work that's being done on Highway 1 from, you know, Kelowna all the way to, to the Alberta border and the Kicking Horse Canyon project that's going to start in the next few months. So really, it looks like, you know, it looks like the provinces have really zeroed in on those transportation networks. And they're doing a lot of great work getting that part of the trade equation worked on. Um, you know, but you brought up an interesting point, Christy, and I want to expand on it if I could, which is the electrification. Because I think that you look at things like the hydroelectric assets that we have across Canada, and some of them are getting to a point where significant investments in refurbishment are needed. But you're not going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on refurbishment and then spend hundreds of extra millions of dollars in the hope that perhaps there's a good reason to expand the wattage that you're bringing from that facility without that real government commitment to electrification at the national level. And just wondering, you know, it, as part of this, you know, in order to make that electrification investment, don't we sort of need a, a clear signal from the federal government that electrification of our vehicle network is going to be a priority and thus we need that extra capacity from our hydroelectric producers? Yes, we do. We really, I mean, um, we proposed, we, we, we started work with the Trudeau government on electrification from, you know, Site C. We, Site C sat on the books for 50 years in British Columbia and just nobody, could, we finally got it going and approved and it's underway. Um, it's going to produce a huge amount of new energy, which we thought, you know, we'll, we'll build our, we'll use that to, um, to make sure that our LNG uh, product is the cleanest in the world and electrify that. But, you know, um, it looks as though it may be, it's going to be better uh, for Canada's climate goals to send that to Alberta um, to work, to help, to help them. So, but it is a massively expensive project to get that uh, energy across, across the border. And it will be massively expensive to get it from Manitoba and Churchill all the way to here as well. So they're all the way to, Oops, sorry about that. Somebody else is FaceTiming me. Um, 
And so I, you know, you, the provinces just don't have the fiscal capacity to be able to do that. And I would argue it's a national project. We want to make sure that we are uh, meeting our, our Paris climate goals. We want to make sure that we're supporting the oil sands, uh, the most ethical oil produced anywhere in the world and vitally important for our healthcare system and for our, 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 the federal coffers. So if, if, you know, that's a national project to me, and that means that uh, the federal government's got to step up and that, you know, I think they should be saying, okay, you know, we don't, you don't want to have an electric car if it's, if it's powered by coal, it's not better. Right. Let's have an electric car and let's make sure that it's powered by Canada's vast electricity network. Vast, um, um, I should say, yeah, our, our clean electricity network. Yeah, well, I agree with that entirely. And, and uh, you know, we did a lot of work uh, on that. Uh, I think part of the issue for a lot of these big projects is obviously around the financing uh, aspects of it and how that and, you know, that can have, as Newfoundland has found out, that can have um, uh, real impact on your uh, on your bottom line. So the question on a lot of these projects is you see them being, you know, the way that the that the amortization takes place is over, you know, 30 or 35 years. And, and, and really that's, you know, that that's not an equation that's going to work for, for the, for the provinces. So, um, you know, we had the federal government uh, uh, look at things like loan guarantees, but, but even that, that kind of participation is really not enough uh, to make these projects, some of these projects palatable, uh, especially for smaller uh, for smaller provinces. So, um, uh, you know, if you want to meet these, uh, these targets, then you have to look at, you know, how these projects are going to be financed and you have to look at the, the kind of uh, a regional participation model. Um, a lot of that infrastructure, especially in Atlantic Canada, needs to continue to be upgraded. And it's interesting you bring up the finance issue because finance and procurement is obviously something that's really big on the mind of, of us looking forward to some of these, you know, shovel ready brand new projects. And what is that uh, finance model that we should be using? You know, where do P3s play into this mix of infrastructure stimulus to get some of our bigger projects built? You know, is there opportunity to take advantage of what the Canada Infrastructure Bank has available? But also, you know, we, we've seen some newer procurement uh, models that, you know, it's it's interesting to see, you know, kind of where this all fits as we look forward. Are we just looking at, you know, the government's going to pay the capital cost and it's up to the project owner to deal with the O&M? Or are we going to look at some of those models where, where the O&M is taken under consideration and is part of the payment plan for these projects? Because certainly, you know, you look at some of the legacy of what's happened since the 2008 recession, some of those projects that were built across Canada have been incredible assets for those communities. And then the communities have struggled with the operations and maintenance budget that have been that have been taken alongside them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's funny, I think that attitudes toward the uh, question of P3s differs, differs a lot from where you are in the country. Oh, there we are. And, uh, you know, it's been an issue um, in Atlantic Canada, but the reality is that those contracts are based on, you know, the, the actual negotiation that's being done by the by the parties. And if you design a bad contract, you get a bad result. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, I think our, the level of expertise in terms of, uh, of governments has grown um, dramatically since the first ones uh, were put in place. And there are, are the, the benefits for uh, prov provinces have, have in fact increased greatly over um, the last number of years. I see John's uh, here. Welcome, John. Thank Great. you for Sorry, we've had trouble, tech trouble getting in. <laughs> That's John. okay. This is what happens when every single household has got every single electronic device working simultaneously. That's right bound to have some electronic issues. So, so John, let me, let me bring you into the conversation. I'm, I'm sure you've heard part of what was said. Um, so just from your perspective, would really like to hear, you know, <coughs> what you were able to do as far as infrastructure stimulus priorities following the 2008 sure. recession and how that needs to differ this time around. Sure. I, um, uh, I'll say just a number of things. First, the first thing you've got to do is cut the red tape to make things happen quickly. Uh, and that's not doing regulation more efficiently. It's less regulation. You don't need one project, one environmental assessment is good enough. You don't need to do a federal environmental assessment when you're replacing the roof on a community center in small town Ontario. Um, you, uh, we went to the uh, one page uh, application forms. 
um, and just dramatically cut the um, the uh, the bureaucracy. Uh, the Harper government struggled to get infrastructure dollars spent in our first mandate, as the as the Trudeau government has, and I think. Uh, I think the uh, Catherine McKenna, the new infrastructure minister, is the one that's uh, going to grab the bull by the horns and make this happen. Two, you genuinely need uh, a partnership. You need to have other levels of government partnering because you can make your dollar uh, go a lot farther. And when someone and other people have skin in the game, it keeps everyone uh, honest and also limits the uh, the demands from uh, provinces, provincial governments, and municipalities. Um, and then finally, you need to uh, put aside politics and uh, work together. Um, you know, uh, this is inherently, I call it a small p political. You need an empowered minister who can uh, make decisions. And I remember we were having trouble, frankly, with uh, Nova Scotia when um, uh, when uh, the NDP was in power. Uh, at one point, I just had my chief of staff pick up the, call, pick the phone and call Daryl's chief of staff. And within two days, we'd struck a deal to get uh, the money going, the money flowing. And um, you need to be able to, uh, to do that. Um, when you have a good relationship, it can go very well. Uh, but, you know, even we had a very bad relationship with the McGuinty government in Ontario. I was the critic, actually, of the infrastructure minister three years before. Uh, but uh, we made, uh, we, uh, given the crisis uh, was so severe and so, uh, and so challenging, we put politics aside and, uh, and made things happen. And uh, I think you know, even Danny Williams' government in Newfoundland, we were able to work uh, well with. But you need to have an empowered minister who can make things happen. And strangely, you know, I think Catherine McKenna will be able to work very well with Doug Ford's Ontario. Um, they, uh, she's taking the right attitude and the right approach. Um, the real concern I have is that the amount of debt we're going in is just, it's just staggering. And uh, uh, it's going to go, um, uh, the best way to stimulate the economy, frankly, in my view, is get the economy open. Um, you know, I have three construction sites outside my uh, window here in uh, Toronto, and one of them is closed down and two of them are working. Well, there's a 70-story CIBC tower under construction. Surely, to goodness, in a 70-story tower, we could get five or ten construction workers, sheet metal workers, drywallers getting to work right away. It wouldn't cost a dime. Uh, they can uh, they can uh, find a way to make that, that work, in my opinion. Sorry, Christy, I wasn't sure if you wanted to remark on, on what Daryl had said previously or expand on anything John had said as well. Well, you know, Andrew, I'm looking at some of the comments that are coming up. Should we, can I speak to some of those? Yeah, by all means, please. Uh, one of them, I think Mark said, there's a difference between shovel ready and shovel worthy, which I think is, which is really important as uh, to think about. Um, and, you know, that gets back to my, to my point about investing in infrastructure. And John, you weren't here yet, but I was complimenting your government on how focused you guys oh, were on. Uh, now we're yeah, economic growth on projects that we're going to grow the economy. So I think that's one thing. Another, someone else said, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't be talking about pipelines. I totally disagree with that. I think that we need electrification and growing our green economy at the same time as we grow our pipeline capacity. And I don't think you can say um, that we don't need the gateways to grow because you know our problem. One of the one of the gaps has been exposed. Um, in in this COVID uh, world has been when you know we we don't have a diversity of uh, customers for what we produce. Um, we don't have a diver we don't have strength um, and leverage in our negotiations with other countries. We are a supplier to the Americans, and that is just about all we do. And it's great they're good friends when they mostly want to be good friends. But we need more friends, and that means opening up, building our gateways out. And I don't think any, t you know, anytime soon that China is going to stop, at, and India and the Asian um, hub is going to stop growing faster than we are here. They're going to continue on that trajectory, and we need to be able to supply them to diversify our economy and be able to leverage um, leverage that strength. Yeah, I don't think there's a I don't think there's a conflict between those people who desire to have secure supply chains within the within the uh, uh, country on 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 uh, on food security and and other associated issues, but and continuing to be able to build uh, uh, trade corridors and and to build uh, trade uh, links uh, is uh, from Nova Scotia's perspective, particularly with the um, European Union. John, I'm sure you heard the conversation about the different types of investment we talked about, you know, empowering hydroelectric by telling them that there's an electric future and through trade routes and ports and everything else. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, from 2009 to today, 
have our priorities for infrastructure stimulus changed? Um, what you focused on investing in, you and the, and the rest of the Harper government focused on investing in, in 2009. Are we seeing similar priorities in 2020 or has there been a bit of a shift as well? I think it depends on um, it depends on the, uh, the, the federal actors. Christy mentioned uh, members of parliament and uh, and ministers that are on the, the cabinet table. Obviously, uh, Catherine McKenna, uh, as a former environment minister, she's going to put green infrastructure uh, high on the list, uh, wastewater treatment, um, uh, and uh, things to reduce the um, to reduce uh, the carbon footprint. Um, I think this government, obviously, are, they're true believers when it comes to climate change uh, and the environment, and I think that'll be a bigger priority. But you'll also have the uh, the priorities in uh, of different governments uh, across the uh, across the country. There is also what I would call national infrastructure, uh, whether it's the Detroit River International Crossing. That's not a Windsor or an Ontario project. That's a national piece of infrastructure. The Asia Pacific Gateway is actually is absolutely key to our future economic uh, prosperity. So if there's uh, investments that can be made in things like that. Uh, or, you know, as, as uh, Daryl mentioned about shipbuilding in, um, in, uh, in uh, the Maritimes, uh, th this is, this is, these are tremendously important uh, projects uh, that, uh, that, uh, that need support. And uh, frankly, um, <clears throat> the challenge is, is to, once you make an announcement that you're giving a dollar towards a project, that province or that municipality feels they own it. And sometimes if these things are not well run, they can go on delay after delay after delay. I'm a, uh, Union Station is about uh, two blocks from where I'm sitting right uh, right now. I announced the funding for that project in 2009. They proudly proclaimed it would all be done in six years, which I thought was crazy. It shouldn't take six years to refurbish a building. And you know, it's 2020 and it's still under construction today. Uh, so you need to, you need to, um, we had a, we had a, a very powerful uh, clause in our stimulus funding, not the regular funding, but the stimulus funding to say, listen, if you say you can complete this in two years, we'll take you at your word. But we're turning off the tap in two years, and that put some discipline and rigor in the system that municipalities and provinces only came forward with projects that they could get going quickly and get done. And uh, I think we had about 2% of projects, took an extra six months, but uh, 30 months is still pretty uh, bloody good for uh, 23,500 projects. What you've got to do, though, is empower um, uh, ministers at the federal provincial level. If if the bureaucracies are going to like score everything and you know get all their ducks in a row, nothing ever happens. You know, I can remember I got a call from uh, Gordon Campbell uh, when he was Premier of British Columbia, and he says, "I'm sending my Minister of Infrastructure, Kevin Falcon, uh, to see you tomorrow night. You're free for dinner, right?" And uh, literally, we uh, were able to make uh, a huge amount of uh, decisions over dinner. And uh, then we met with Stockwell Day, the political minister, the following morning. Uh, he blessed it, made some changes, and we were able to get things going very, very quickly in uh, in BC. So you need a real, a real attitude. And the, I mentioned uh, the same with uh, with Daryl. Uh, nothing was happening in Nova Scotia. We got on the phone with his office, and within two days, we were uh, planning announcements. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the solutions to this too that we were, really worked for us here was doing project boards. So you bring you know you have a dedicated project board for every major project, and their whole app you know these are very senior people. You can do it from across government, so you're working collaboratively, and their job is to go back and kick down the barriers that are in the way and just get it done. Now, of course, you want to have as many P3s as you can, so that so that and you're you're de-risking. Uh, but you but you want to make sure that you are building in project timelines as john pointed out where if you go over it's going to cost a whole bunch of money um we did you know the hydro project the site c project until uh, the government changed was right on pro on target because if we missed a timeline if we missed a date the government had to eat the cost of that to the contractor and so we were able we we miraculously kept this massive biggest infrastructure project we've ever done in BC's history on budget and on time because we had project boards and because we had very clear contractual obligations to the contractors. We've got just under 10 minutes to go and there's, and there's one other major discussion point I want to make sure we bring up because it hasn't entered the conversation and that's the North. Um, you know, there is a need for clean energy in the north. There is a need for stronger transportation routes in the north. But to the point about ports, there are some opportunities for some deep water ports to be built in the north. And I'm just wondering, when you look at the state of northern Canada currently, I'm just kind of curious if you have any thoughts on what some of those investment priorities need to be in northern Canada to get the Arctic working for the rest of the country. 
I, I really think you need to be, you need to have some market discipline. I don't think generally speaking, I think electric, I was the Minister of Energy in Ontario, electricity is a provincial issue um, and it should be paid for by uh, the ratepayers. So I'm not necessarily a fan on uh, on that. With respect to, um, you know, ports, airports, that sort of thing up in, the, up in the, uh, the north, there really should be a business case for it. I mean, the government, you know, we look at, um, we're making investments in the port of uh, Vancouver. Well, that port is overcrowded and desperately needs it. And there's a market case for both Prince Rupert and for the uh, the ports in Greater Vancouver. Um, I'm not sure the, a deep water port up uh, up in the north, is there a market uh, for it? Will there be, you know, the, the port of Churchill, Manitoba, for example, you know, great port, but is there a market? You know, and if you say build it and they will come, no, you got to build it when they're going to come. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I, so I think you got to have some sort of uh, market uh, discipline in that uh for uh for these infrastructure projects i guess i agree uh to a certain extent but i still think there's this wealth of resources that exist in the north you know part of the question is how do they get developed and how do they get to market um so you know there is obviously a role for the federal government to play uh in the resource development uh, uh of the north and and you know to work with the territorial governments on on uh, how that happens Mm -hmm. Stephen Harper was big on the north. We built the, um, he, uh, at his direction, one of the only projects he personally got involved with was the uh, the road to Tuktoyaktuk from Anuvik. And uh, I mean, the basic sort of infrastructure, I agree with Daryl, is, uh, is important. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I do agree that um, you've got to have a market for what you, you don't, you, you don't, you want to avoid getting into these big government boondoggles. But I do think, um, uh, you know, in, in, in Canada today, because of, Indigen the requirement for indigenous consultation and accommodation beca and because of our, you know, all of the other commitments that Canada has, we will be wise to take a an approach where government is active in supporting the private sector in creating economic infrastructure. So what, I, you know, I remember when we were fighting about, um, about the uh, pipeline uh, the Northern Gateway Pipeline. I remember the Premier of Alberta at the time saying, this is a commercial decision. The pipeline proponents have to figure it out. And my view was, you can't just do that anymore in Canada. We have, governments have to be there shoulder to shoulder with the private sector, negotiating and work, representing the Crown with Indigenous people and uh, with communities to some extent, and making sure that our legislative framework is gonna work for these investors. We no longer live in a world where commercial decisions can just be commercial decisions when it comes to huge infrastructure. And every day that is getting harder because of the new requirements that are set out by the Supreme Court and because of the new, the changing landscape that's being created with ongoing negotiations, like as I mentioned, the issues with the Wet'suwet'en in British Columbia that's going to be signed today. It's all, all that landscape's changing and you can't ask the private sector to just figure all that stuff out on its own anymore. One, one big thing as well is there's really two issues here. One, how do you get existing uh, infrastructure monies out the door and uh, and have construction begin as soon as possible? Uh, that's a huge challenge that uh, Catherine McKenna has got. Uh, decisions have been slow and the money flowing has been even uh, slower. Then there's the issue of will there be stimulus measures, new new monies uh, allocated to, uh, to go above and beyond that? And uh, in large measure, that will be a budget decision uh and uh, she uh she could put some requests in for example but it, it would be a major accomplishment just to get the uh, the federal infrastructure dollars uh, uh flowing and uh that, that's a there, there's a huge amount uh, allocated in the existing framework and uh and uh, let's uh, let's hope it goes uh, let's hope it goes well there is a crisis i mean obviously this is like a great depression we're looking at and we saw people put aside politics uh, at the federal and uh, provincial and municipal levels. Uh, also, I think that uh, you know labor unions uh, and, uh, and First Nations uh, were much more cooperative when we were uh, you know at the bottom of the uh, economic cycle in 2009. And uh, let's hope that same um, that same spirit of cooperation uh, is is uh, is there. Yeah, they need to be included though on the front end on the program design, and that would make it much easier to have those conversations. And I agree with John, and, and, and particularly around questions associated with some of the funding in the supercluster um, uh, um, uh, fund that was there. I'd like to see a lot of that get out of the door. Yeah. Well, folks, unfortunately, we're at the top of the hour, so uh, our, our presentation time is done. I want to say a very sincere thank you to John, Christy, and Daryl for joining us today for what was an excellent conversation on 
what was done then and what needs to be done now and, and what we've learned in the past decade of, of infrastructure spending. So thank you so very much for joining us today. Christy, John, Daryl, your, your input on this was incredibly appreciated. Thank you so very much. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who attended today. We really appreciate you uh, taking part in today's discussion. Of course, do try to you know get to a few more points in as you send us some more questions, which we'll work to answer following this discussion. Be sure to participate in the polls. Also want to remind you to follow Actual Media on Crowdcast. Uh, this was kind of a special one-off presentation for us, but Renew Canada does host industry discussions on the fourth Thursday morning of every month. And we invite you to join us on Thursday, May 28th for our next discussion, which will focus on construction's health and safety regime. And we're pleased to welcome partners, Leuna Local 183, the IHSA and ResCon for that conversation. That's Thursday, May 28th from 9.30 a.m to 11 a.m. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. This presentation will be available to be viewed once again a couple hours from now at this exact same link. And if you have any other questions you'd like to ask, please feel free to send me an email at any time. It's really easy to, to remember, andrew at actualmedia.ca. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day.